And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Thompson now. Well, again, I appreciate your inviting me to Faulkner University. I have known about Faulkner University. Some of our faculty have come from uh, Faulkner, and uh, some of your faculty have come from Abilene Christian. So uh, there's been some kind of a partnership here, and uh, glad to be here. Uh, also coming from Abilene, glad to see a place with the uh, tall trees and things I'm not uh, all that used to. So the uh, drive we drove, uh, the drive was uh, very pleasant. I, uh, I once heard a story that uh, Don Morris, who was president of Abilene Christian, went to visit Lipscomb and he saw the tall trees. And he asked uh, the president of Lipscomb, what is your water bill? And uh, he saw the tall trees and he, he, could have, he couldn't imagine that at uh, Abilene Christian and thought that must be a humongous water bill uh, to have such uh, tall trees there. So uh, it's been nice and uh, this is a lovely campus that you have. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, reflect with you. Uh, if you have the uh, handout, uh, it's not exactly an outline, but there's some things. Uh, I came kicking and screaming into PowerPoint, and um, I sometimes teach with PowerPoint, but it uh, distracts from my, I'm not coordinated enough to do the PowerPoint, and. Uh, but I did want some things out in visually for you. And uh, the topic today is uh, spiritual formation is corporate formation. And uh, that's the handout uh, that you should be seeing. Well, uh, a term that uh, came into my vocabulary a decade or so uh, ago was the term spiritual formation. Uh, Little did I know that that's a very, very old word. Uh, it goes back to the Middle Ages and to the Reformation period. And originally had to do uh, with the uh, preparation of uh, priests uh, to, to be sure that they were people of integrity and uh, spiritual development. Uh, as it has come down, of course, it has become the common property of almost every tradition. And it's, it's, it's obviously a very good thing. And uh, the conversation about spiritual formation usually has to do with uh, developing spiritual disciplines like uh, prayer, fasting, hospitality. Um, all of those are areas of spiritual formation. I suppose I could say that the Apostle Paul uh, has given us that terminology, though he didn't actually ever say give the expression spiritual formation. At least uh, Apostle Paul does uh, talk about people who are spiritual. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, the, those of you who are spiritual, uh, restore someone uh, to the faith. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 15 and following, uh, there are spiritual people and there are non-spiritual people. So you have the word spiritual uh, which uh, has its roots in Fallout theology. You also have the uh, expression of formation many times. Uh, Paul likes the, to use the word, uh, the Greek word morphe, and he uses it in several uh, uh, passages. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 3 and in Romans 12, he talks about the metamorphosis. That's the Greek word that he uses, uh, except he uses the verb form that uh, there is a metamorphosis among Christians. Or in Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 20, he looks to the end time. When we will be conformed, sumo or fellow, we will be conformed to the image of his son. And he uses this very same word in Romans 8, 29 uh, to talk about uh, the, the formation that takes place in uh, believers. So Paul actually gave us some of that terminology of spiritual formation, though he didn't use the word. What I want to talk about today, though, is uh, all that goes under the name of spiritual formation, you, you, 
cannot argue with the spiritual disciplines, uh, and they are appropriate for all of us. But I want to take us to uh, another dimension in Paul, and that is, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, Paul thinks in terms of communities. And uh, as I mentioned yesterday, when Paul says you, he means y'all. And, uh, and he writes to churches, and so he thinks of them as a collective, in the same way that Israel is a collective. God chose the people uh, to, to, to be his own people. Uh, Americans, uh, perhaps Westerners all think of groups as a collection of individuals. Uh, but if you go into Asian cultures even today, the sense of corporate identity is very, very strong. And that's a part of Israel, the sense of corporate identity. I, uh, I would like you looking at the handout, and uh, I teach a course in Pauline theology. And one of the uh, issues always in Pauline theology is what is the center of Paul's thought? And for uh, about three or 400 years, we've learned from Luther, and uh, the person on the street is likely to say, the center of Paul's thought is justification by faith. And uh, that's really been where people have been over the last several centuries. But that's been challenged in the uh, last generation, that that's the center of Paul's theology. And it's challenged by the fact that Paul only develops those themes in Romans and Galatians, that there is more to it than that. And uh, when I think about what is the center of Paul's theology, I think one of the overlooked areas that I want to propose today is to look first of all at his prayers. You know a lot about Paul's theology as you look at his prayers. And that's why I have the, uh, the handout for us today. Paul begins uh, most of his letters, almost all of his letters, uh, by reporting about his prayers. And I think you know a lot about Paul from seeing what he prays about. So I think he's actually leading his community in prayer. What is, what is uppermost in his mind as he looks at, uh, at his communities? So I, I uh, have some passages that I, that's why I have the handout, uh, so that we can see visually how important this is for Paul. So he writes, uh, he writes to the Corinthians, uh, actually, he write, when he writes to the Romans, he does not know them, and so you don't have this particular expression that we will see. But 1 Corinthians 1, 8, so that you will be blameless at the day of Christ. And again, as I mentioned yesterday, my Greek students have learned to say, so that y'all may be blameless at the day of Christ. Or as he says in Philippians 1, 6, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among y'all will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And then again in Philippians, to help you deter determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory of God. Just as he chose us from the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. And may he strengthen your hearts in holiness, that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. Or the closing benediction of First Thessalonians. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may have noticed there the number of passages that I just read that have the word blameless. And anyone who reads the Old Testament uh, recognizes that in the Psalms uh, and in the wisdom literature, there's the sense of who is blameless or righteous before God. And... Uh, so, so the prayer is about moral formation. May you as a community be blameless at the coming of Christ. 
That's another way of saying spiritually formed. And I call to your attention the, uh, the, the fact that uh, every one of the passages that I read has an eschatological uh, vision at the day of Christ, at the day of Christ, that uh, the people are spiritually formed at the day of Christ. Now, uh, as I look at that, there's a sense of blamelessness. And that, uh, one reason I pointed this out is that all of Paul's letters have this constant theme. And so when we think about what is he really about, uh, what comes to mind is what he's really about, whatever the community's situation, is where are they going to be? Where are they going to be at the end time? Will they be spiritually formed? And that is the challenge, and that is what, uh, what uh, Paul uh, indicates here as important to him. His prayer reports are uh, vital and important for us. I also think about uh, there are times when Paul talks about what he's about. So I mentioned his prayer reports uh, that begin his, his letters uh, and they indicate something of what he is really about. There are also occasions when he steps back and says, here is what my ministry is all about. And I uh, call your attention to, uh, and I think I will go sequentially in his letters, uh, again on the handout. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Is it not y'all? That is, at the second coming, what do I want to accomplish? It, would, it is going to be a blameless community. Now there's an expression in Isaiah chapter 49 where the servant is speaking in, in this particular passage. And there's the phrase, so that I not run in vain. And Paul picks up that phrase out of Isaiah chapter 49. And there is a, there's the alternative in his, his own ministry. Will he run in vain as a minister? And running in vain as a minister means a community that began well and did not finish. So that uh, in, in, in Pauline correspondence, the, the church is his crown of boasting before our Lord. Or the next passage in Philippians. It is by your holding fast the word of life that I can boast in the day of Christ that I did not run for labor in vain. Now that's a passage again that goes back and it's echoing Isaiah chapter 49, 6. Paul is taking that role of the servant who either runs in vain or does not. And running in vain, of course, means a community that does not finish its, its, uh, uh, its work. Or, I would say, the uh, book of 2 Corinthians is uh, about whether Paul is a true minister or not. The word ministry appears about as many times in 2 Corinthians as all the other letters of Paul put together. Uh, are they ministers? So am I. Now, in the thesis statement of 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, he says, I want to be your boast at the day of Christ, and I want you to be my boast. Now, that word boast kind of uh, has a negative reaction with many of us, but uh, I guess to put it in better alternative English is to say, I want to be proud of you at the day of Christ. This is what I'm going to be proud of. Again, that I did not run in vain. And you see this so much as, as Paul talks about what he is about. That on the, the day of the Lord, we are your most even as you are ours. Uh, they uh, have challenged his ministry. And so in our passage, he 
He's hoping that 2 Corinthians will answer their questions about whether he is a minister or not. So he can say, I want to be your boast. I want you to be proud of me. But I want to be proud of you as, uh, as we look toward the end. Or in the, uh, the next passage, Colossians 1.22. He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him to present you. The word present is a word for offering a sacrifice. This is what I'm going to offer to God at the end time. Or, of course, you know, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is uh, he's the father of the bride. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I betrothed you to Christ so that I might present you a pure virgin. And that, of course, is eschatological. That is toward the end time. But to me, this is the, this is the challenge of, of reading Paul. As I mentioned uh, a, a few minutes ago, for so long we thought that the center of Paul's theology was justification by faith. But it's been called to our attention that uh, this is the center of Paul's theology is about how to get in. And there is so much of our reflection, our understanding of missions, which is how do you get in? And of course that is important. Uh, Paul is an evangelist. He gets people in. But Paul, is, as he says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, I have anxiety for all the churches. He didn't just leave them, he wrote letters. And if he couldn't uh, communicate otherwise, he sent his, uh, uh, his co-workers, Timothy and Titus, to follow up on his churches. Now, I think we can learn something. Um, if justification by faith is about how to get in, something is left out. What about moral formation? Uh, as we saw Paul's prayer reports and when we see what Paul is about. In some passages he talks about, I want to preach Christ where Christ has never been named. And that is to be able to bring people in. But in the passages that we just saw, my ambition is to have something that I boast about at the end, in, at the end time. I want a transformed people. teaching, I, uh, I don't know how many times I uh, engage students who are really ambitious, faithful, and the world is before them, and what they want to do is to go plant a church. Because that is exciting, to create something, or to be a part of something that hasn't happened before, to create a church, to, to, to plant one. But I always want to ask, where will you be 10 years later? After you have planned it, where will you be? Where will they be? It's, it's exciting to start, but it's another thing to transform people. There's a long history of uh, church planting. I've, I've traveled enough in Europe to know of church plants that started off uh, with the excitement of something new. But time passed by and they languish because the excitement uh, was not there. And so as, as the time goes on, it was about getting people in. It was about getting something started. And it did not, it, it did not last. For the Apostle Paul, uh, justification by faith is largely, well, it's been misunderstood to me about getting people in. Because if you continue to read Romans, it's not just getting people in, it's getting people transformed, uh, as, as uh, Paul describes it. Um, I'd like for you to take, take your Bible to a passage that I think is, I think it's my favorite. It's one that we just looked at. It's the Thanksgiving in the book of Philippians. I live with this passage. 
I guess when I, I'm asked to go to speak and I know nothing about the church, I think I usually pick this passage. It's not as if, as if I just give the same old sermon, I, but uh, this passage means so much to me. As Paul, his relationship with the Philippians, he founded the church and didn't get to stay very long. And there is a continuing relationship between Paul and the Philippians before he writes. Other people have not sent him, sent him financial support, but the Philippians have. And there is a good relationship. Now, as Paul writes to the Philippians, he is in prison. And there is a very, very serious question before the Philippians. And that is, where does the church go from here? Our leader is in prison. I don't know if there are any doctrinal issues in Philippians. I'm not, I don't think there are. But there is anxiety. That's why Paul said, don't be anxious. There is anxiety because you're a minority community in a Roman colony. And in this Roman co colony, you are a very fragile, uh, weak uh, community in the midst of a great Roman power. What is going to happen to the church? Besides that, uh, you apparently have two women who are quarreling. Uh, two people quarreling in the house church of 30 would indicate there is, there's a challenge. Where are we going to be later on? And I come back to Philippians more and more. As I think in Philippians, uh, beginning in uh, chapter 1, verse 3, I give thanks to my God in all my memory, always, in every petition, on behalf of all of you, with joy, making mention at the fellowship of the gospel from the first day until now. Being persuaded of this very thing, that the one who began among you a good work will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And what I see in this passage is that every church is telling its own story. There is, this, there is a narrative. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, to be church is to be a part of Israel's narrative. You, are, you came into the narrative midway. But to be church is to be a part of Israel's narrative. But this is kind of beyond my comprehension, knowing church as I know church today. Here is the sense of a church that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And every church, this church, every church, is in the middle of a narrative. And so uh, this passage I come back to so often because it talks about the middle of the, the church is in the middle of a narrative. God began a good work above y'all. That is, he established a church. There's the first day until now. That's where we are in the middle of the story. And despite all of the sources of anxiety that we have with uh, Roman power all around us, and people who have been abandoned by their families, there is a future. And I am convinced, Paul says, that the one who began a good work will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. Now think about that, uh, the implications of that for church life today. The church is telling a story. That doesn't really work with our tradition of individualism, does it? Where people opt in and opt out. They go to this one or they go to that one. And I don't know how it worked in his day. He didn't, his churches didn't have the mobility that we have today where people move from place to place. Probably they're more stationary. But it's, a, it's not just people who are being formed, uh, individuals being formed. God is at work and has begun a good work. That's when they were converted. And they, they are in the middle of a story. And God is going to bring it to completion. Now he goes on in, in his prayer in verse 
verses 9 through 11, tells you what he's looking for. We're not there yet. We're in the middle of that story. But what is it going to look like when we get there? And there's where you have a petition. Here's my prayer. And my prayer is that uh, your love may abound more and more in full knowledge and in all perception. You notice he doesn't talk about loving one another here. He, he says that you learn to love. He doesn't mention the object. It's a learning process. This is my prayer. You're not there yet. You and Cynthia are still quarreling. But that you will be there and that you will love, learn to love more and more in knowledge. Again, it's a learning thing, but in knowledge and in full perception. I don't know what your translation says here. The Greek word here is uh, aesthesis, from which we get the word aesthetics. And I think that's interesting. Uh, aesthetics is uh, art, music appreciation, and so forth. Uh, I can remember I had a required course at, uh, in my graduate days in aesthetics. And I kind of defied them to teach me anything because I was a, an absolute Philistine didn't know the importance of art or music or anything like that. And so I wasn't uh, in the uh, mood to learn much about it. And I also didn't do very well in, in the course because uh, aesthetics didn't mean much to me. Now, as I got older and I traveled, I think, what I wish I had learned back then. Aesthetics. That is, uh, aesthetics is a sense of touch. Uh, a sense of uh, perception and touch. And he says, this is my prayer, that you learn to love more and more, not just love one another, learn to love with touch. That's a learning process. And that is spiritual formation, to learn that way. And the very next line, that you may learn to approve the better things. It's actually a, a, an expression very well known among Stoics. To, to, to be a good person among Stoics is to approve the better things. Now Paul has taken their word and he's redefined it. But what he's saying is that spiritual formation is corporate formation. It is moral formation. That's what spiritual formation is. Moral formation within the context of a community. Now, I think, think, think of the fact, all of us in our churches are in the middle of a story. Now, in, in Paul's day, they, they turned from paganism to the radical change of being, being a Christian. We live in a kind of different society from that. All of Paul's converts were first-generation converts, sort of like the mission field today. First. Uh, generation convert. What a radical change that took place with them. I want to read a, a, a few other passages that indicate something of the radical change. That is to say, we all had a beginning. Churches live in the middle of the narrative, and we look back to the beginning. I'm going to read some passages. I, I, mean, I, I don't have that in handout. But what I'm looking for are the passages that say y'all were once this and now you are this. That is the beginning of the story when God began a good work. So I just 